Good morning, folks. Thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to see you all. This is super strange, this context of talking. I can't hear myself. <laughs> uh, anyway, OK, it's a silent rave. Uh, I'm Lulu Lemaire. I'm a producer at Google uh, on, our, on the Daydream Publishing Group, working to support developers, uh, like all of you, uh, to get your apps onto our smartphone AR and VR platforms, which are Tango and Daydream, respectively. So I started as a producer type person um, back in 1999. I was working at a company called Looking Glass Studios, um, which was somewhat famous at the time uh, for its unique approach to Im immersive gaming. Um, and since then, I've worked uh, in development and in publishing and at big companies and at tiny little indies. Um, I've been through a lot of uh, hardware transformations and a few big shifts in the way that we think about games and other interactive content, uh, though none maybe as potentially profound as this uh, exploration of VR and AR that we're in right now. So all of us who are working in VR and AR are here uh, in the industry because we're really hopeful about this future. Like, we think that it's going to go somewhere. We think that it's uh, interesting and full of, uh, of potential. And we at Google, we've worked with hundreds of developers to bring apps and games uh, to Tango and Daydream. We're really, really proud of the, of the content that folks have brought. After this first round of AR and VR, there's some kind of nuggets, some um, common characteristics among these apps that are getting a lot of attention and that are getting more time in the, that people are spending more time with in the headset. Sort of those are our uh, metrics for success, more time in headset and more adoption, right? Um, so I want to talk about some of these characteristics and speculate about where they might lead. Um, not just things that are working, uh, but also deterrence to folks spending more time in VR. Google really wants to reach everyone. Uh, we're interested in mass scale, global scale, and for AR, for AR and VR to be accessible at some level to the broadest possible audience. Um, but we have a long way to go before we see immersive computing as this dominant computing metaphor, or even as a dominant hobby or activity uh, for a large population of people. It's still so very niche. Anyway, so let's talk about these deterrents um, and how y'all can sidestep them when developing your next apps for VR and AR. So here's the quick version. Here's the uh, bullet point version of my talk. <laughs> A couple things that are working, involved narrative uh, and spatial successes, and a couple deterrents which sort of boil down to other people in real life, um, and some metaphors that I think are interesting to think about when creating um, experience, uh, interactive experiences. So the first thing I want to talk about is narrative uh, and how our experiences of story and characters are amplified in VR. Um, the agency that you have by controlling your view means that in VR, you are structurally involved in the narrative. A neutral viewpoint um, is really impossible to conceive of because the control, the agency that you have with your view um, means that you are there, right? Um, this is really compelling, and we're seeing a lot of games with sort of what I would call more involved narrative content having a lot of appeal for users. Um, so let's talk about kind of a precursor. Um, some sort of pre-VR uh, seeds of this involved content. I worked on this game and a couple other Tomb Raider games. Um, when we were doing playtesting towards the end, I was really interested to hear um, that our players didn't really identify with Lara Croft, the protagonist. Like, they didn't feel like they were embodying her. They felt like they had this other role as her protector. Uh, and her guide, right? The relationship between Lara and her third person protector or controller or whatever is really like one-sided. You can feel like you protect her, like you 
care about her or you are invested in her success, but she doesn't give a damn about you, right? And it kind of works with Lara Croft's character. She's like forever atta unattainable and unreachable. So you can see in this screenshot, she's like sitting in judgment of you. <laughs> it kind of works with her character, right? So you feel connected to Lara, but it is totally one-sided. Um, a relatively successful game on Daydream that came out this summer called Along Together by Turbo Button. Um, it's really a very similar concept. You're controlling a third-person character. In this case, you're helping a kid uh, through a bunch of navigation challenges. And, and helping is important here. Like, instead of you're as this non-entity third-person character that you have to conceive yourself of, right? You are the kid's imaginary friend. You have a real... Um, you have a job, you have some embodiment in the world, and then the character conceives of you as something as well. So by virtue of the perspective that you have and this presence that you have in VR, you're already more structurally involved in the narrative. Along Together is an example where they use that as the starting point to develop a relationship between the player and the game character. So if you're making a narrative-focused experience, you have a unique opportunity to really form meaningful connections uh, with the characters uh, through the involved feeling um, of the camera and the eye contact, of course, afforded by VR. There's plenty of anecdotal data to suggest that if the users care about your characters, then they're going to care about the rest of your content. They'll stay around for the rest of your content. One last note on involved uh, narrative is multiplayer. Um, the relationship that I'm talking about in Along Together is formed by helping the character. Um, the character seeming to see you and acknowledge your help. Um, this is something that MMOs have been doing forever. Um, helping and collaborating where the two people working together um, know each other and this, this is what forms relationships, this is what forms friendships. Uh, and maintains them with real people. So on to uh, sort of a deterrent for VR. When we ask folks what prevents them from spending more time in VR, of course there's like the logistical hurdles of getting in and out of the headset um, and discomfort from weight or heat of the headset. But beyond those things that are fixable with time and tech and you know the companies that are, that are working on VR, we know that they're really good at time and tech, right? So those things are just gonna happen magically, right? Um, but beyond those, one really big reason that people limit their time in the headset is social discomfort. When you're in VR, you are, you remove yourself from everybody else in the room. And we, we know from user surveys that most people who use VR have other people in their households. <laughs> big surprise. So as a way of addressing this, I'm really hyped on asymmetrical VR games uh, as a way to address that isolation. Uh, by asymmetrical, I mean one player in, the, in VR and other players that can participate in some other mode that is not via a VR headset. Um, keep talking and nobody explodes is, the, is sort of our flagship um, asymmetrical VR game. Um, I hope that all of you have played it. If you've spent any time in VR uh, and you haven't, fix it. Um, Offline players, players not in VR, have a physical paper manual to the bombs, uh, and they look up instructions and, and explain them to the person in VR. So that isolation of the person in VR works as a game mechanic and an aesthetic as well, right? They're, they are supposed to feel alone and terrified and make a connection and help uh, the other player, um, get help from the other players and build that relationship. Uh, Climax Studios released a game this summer called Lola and the Giant, a game where you, you can play single player in the headset, uh, or you can play with an asymmetric co-player on an Android device. <coughs> the game deals with a bunch of things that are uniquely, impossible, uh, uniquely possible in VR, the same involved uh, narrative like I was talking about in the prior uh, point, but also the scale differences that, that are really easy and fun to appreciate in VR, where you are this tiny little girl character and there's this giant uh, as the other co-player. So, you know, an obvious question is why do I think um, asymmetrical is a persistent trend rather than <clears throat> an anomaly along the way? Why wouldn't we in the future just all be in really cheap and easy to use VR headsets? Um, 
And I think <clears throat> the question comes down to how completely we expect VR to change people's lives. <coughs> um, maybe VR will be like cars and it will completely reshape cities and it will reshape the way that we visit people and change our exposure to uh, people that are different from us by driving through their neighborhoods and never having to see them. Um, but until some VR like um, flashpoint happens to spark this massive societal change in the way that cars change the world, um, I think it's reasonable to assume, to assume that VR will fit into our already existing, our familiar ways of relating to each other. Game developers and experience makers are always going to have work if people need something to do when they spend time together. So next I want to talk about media competition. Um, the immersion and the focus afforded by VR um, are great because we can be really deeply embedded in something. Um, but they isolate us, from uh, uh, not only from other people in our lives, but um, from other media, including social media, that maybe we want to be engaged with. Um, some surveys we've seen on folk folks' usage patterns in VR indicate that the distraction of other media is a really big reason why folks leave VR. Um, I'm sure it's happened to all of you. You take the headset off to tweet about something, and then you get a little distracted, and you get sucked in, and then you're like, eh, I'm not going to get back in today. You know, it's late. I'm going to go to bed instead, right? Um, it's not just you. It's everybody. Uh, and this is, this is sort of a real major deterrent to people spending more time in VR. So obviously, any given VR experience can't compete with the distraction of social media as a whole, with its constant stream of photos and little clever quips from people that you already know and that you already care about. Um, eventually, we know that this desire to multitask or to be engaged with other things uh, periodically is going to be addressed at the OS level. right? Um, God help us if it feels like this, like a virtual trading desk. <laughs> this is like my version of hell. Just constant streams of competing information that I'm supposed to pay attention to. And uh, No, thank you. So in your own games, what can you do to think about distraction besides wait for this systemic change that's going to come at the OS level? So there's two things I want, to, want you to think about. First, um, we have to think so much more about this liberatedness of, of the experience. The easiest thing to do has to be to stay in the, stay in the experience and keep playing, um, which really m means in VR, you know, we've been doing this uh, with AAA games, with console games, and mobile games, certainly, uh, forever. You know, you play test and find out where the bumps are and try to smooth those bumps out. Um, but with VR, we need to design for breaks because we know that people are not going to sit in front of their TV for two hours like they do with a AAA console game. Um, so when somebody gets into the headset, gets into your experience, and puts, it, puts it on, like they're ready for it. Um, they're, they're really not ready for a break yet. So too many menu options right at the beginning um, or anything that they don't understand right away, they're going to reconsider and they're going to put it down. We find a lot of sort of aborted sessions where people pop in, get kind of overwhelmed, and then take it off. Um, session lengths of 30 seconds of less than a minute. <clears throat> so really think about what you want somebody to accomplish, what that first moment of accomplishment should look at, like before they get up and they go to the bathroom or look away. In, uh, make it hard for them to look away until they get to that point that you want them to get to. So designing for immersion and breaks from immersion um, offers some protection from distraction, but it, at some point we're going to have more distraction from within the headset when, the, when these issues are addressed at the OS level, when you can do multiple things, right? Um, I expect to see a lot of change here as we find out what works. Um, but a lot of you have to solve these problems in your own game fiction, and we've been, we as game developers have been solving like the AR HUD forever, right? It, this, the work that we've done in games has totally informed um, <coughs> AR experiences and is going to continue to, to inform that because that, that's sort of what we think of 
uh, when, when you think of AR is like your health meter <laughs> and you know, your sort of indicator of where the ships are behind you or whatever. Um, those paradigms are what we've created and that already exist. So in your virtual world, your character is going to be interacting with, the, with that world. And like, how do you make it feel real when they are interrupted um, and they need to be given s some kind of information or direction from off screen? Um, in some cases, it's fully grounded, where your character has to walk over and pick up the phone or gets a text message and they pick up their mobile device or whatever. But that obviously isn't the only option, and that's not the only kind of world that we might want to build, one where you have to do these kinds of physical things, right? Untethered by Numinous Games, they, they do this really brilliant um, metaphor for, for notifications. They have this kind of comic book style. Um, it's a visual language that we're familiar with. Um, it's eye-catching and really easy to distinguish from, uh, from the rest of the fictional world. Um, like I said, when, whatever we, the platform holders, do at the OS level uh, to handle real-world distractions like multitasking, they're, they're not going to be the last word. It's just going to be the first iteration. The issue of visual distractions uh, virtual distractions, rather, within your virtual world. This is really fertile ground for UX experimentation. We've already been, you know, we've already been doing this for years, and I really look forward to to seeing how all of you experiment with with this um, virtually in the future, given more space and more sort of gestural controls. Um, so next, I want to talk about layers, <laughs> metaphorically. Um, I think of virtual and augmented reality both as additional layers of information that either replace the real world completely or that accrete on top of the real world. Um, this is easy to think of with AR, like I was saying, the HUD, or um, folks are doing really cool things, for example, with museums. <laughs> uh, this is the Lumen Project at Detroit Institute for the Arts, uh, a tango experience where um, information about this mummy is sort of, as you move your tango device around, uh, you can zoom in on various points to explore more deeply. Basically taking the place of museum placards and making them spatialized um, and potentially more relevant, less work for your brain to stitch together, okay, how does the skeleton fit in there? And just puts it directly on top, right? We've seen other museums kind of decorate their spaces in a in AR with like li living animals or creatures that no longer exist. Um, myself, I'm a little bit obsessed with uh, domestic architecture and especially the way that homes change over time uh, with via additions and renovations. Uh, I like the idea of an XR view that makes those these layers of history that have kind of disappeared or have been replaced, makes them visible. Um, view uh, over time, layering on that information over time. Um, these are two examples of churches that look to me like uh, they are um, mesh accidents where you accidentally embed one thing in the other. Um, but but these, these are like sort of living examples of, of this history that's super visible. Um, I, I also, I'm really interested in this social uh, history, the way, um, places change as the way that the, the things that they are supposed to do change and the way that we live changes, right? So the home changes. So making all that visible is just like a personal obsession of mine. So, so the whole idea of different information, uh, even different worlds layering on top of each other, sort of scratches this particular itch that I've always had since I, maybe since I read the Narnia books. Um, I'm a total sucker for anything that has uh, any kind of fiction that has parallel universes that you travel between. So I was really excited to play this game, Virtual Virtual Reality by Tender Claws. Um, it's about those layers existing, coexisting, and sometimes getting tangled. Um, you are in a virtual world, within a virtual world, within a virtual world, uh, in many cases. So the only thing I want to say here about layers is that I just think this is really fertile ground to explore structurally, like VVR, literally, like in the case of museums. Uh, and I, I really think there's a lot more beyond that um, on the metaphorical side. 
So space is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, I spent a lot of time outdoors as a kid. I really love exploring, uh, specifically like the brain tingly feeling of learning a space, remembering a space, and then needing to recall it, uh, which is why I like visiting new cities. This is my first time in Amsterdam, and I enjoyed that brain tingle on my way over here. Um, our brains are totally made for this. That's why it's uniquely pleasurable, because we're hunter-gatherers. We need to remember spaces. Um, so the appeal, the, this appeal of space and memory making is the reason why I'm in VR. I just find it super interesting. As far as I'm concerned, VR is spatial media. <coughs> so as a gatherer, I identify as a gatherer. I love browsing uh, bookstores and record stores, farmers markets. Uh, it's the discovery of the unexpected uh, and placing the unexpected alongside things that you already know and that are already familiar to you. That tells you that the new thing next to the thing that you already know is something that you might potentially like uh, and care about as much as the familiar thing. Discoverability has been a little bit problematic uh, since we started shopping on the web. So let's solve it in VR. There's no reason why we can't solve it in VR. I can't wait to see just, just the basics, a decent browsing and discovery-focused shopping experience. Let's see it happen. There's no reason why we can't. Um, so now there's a dichotomy right now between physical objects and virtual objects. Um, and I want you all to think about how that's going to change when we have more virtual, persistent virtual spaces of our own. Um, right now, a lot of physical uh, uh, artifacts and collectibles are um, a meaningful secondary income stream for a lot of game developers. Uh, I'm talking about the Art Prints and the Team Fortress minifigs and your Tacoma County Forestry Service mug. Um, there, so there's obviously a desire to make the virtual, things that we experience in virtual spaces, real. So how does this change in an AR future? What kind of virtual real goods do you want your players to display in their real homes via AR or in their virtual spaces via VR? There's some really interesting line crossing there, I think, to think of. So um, space is made, uh, made meaningful by your presence. And what I mean is that your brain makes meaning out of the space because you're there. Um, Lots of virtual experiences hinge on this feeling of presence that everybody talks about all the time, making a feel, user feel like they've actually been there. I have a, I have a feeling that um, experiencing the relative motion of near and far things as you move around a virtual space, um, or a real space, in fact, uh, stitches things together in your mind uh, and, and makes it more memorable. But obviously, moving around is really problematic in VR because nausea is a thing. And even with, with uh, room scale stuff, you can't walk all the way across the Skyrim world, you know? Um, our, our Daydream team released a set of best practice demos called Daydream Elements, which includes a tuned and configurable tunneling experience. When you block out the peripheral view while you're moving, um, it reduces nausea pretty significantly. Uh, Eclipse, uh, Edge of Light, is a game that you can play out in the, um, in the demo area uh, that did this really well using their own sort of tunneling, custom tunneling solution that was grounded in their own fiction. You know, it's a sp you have a space helmet, and as you move, your view focuses in. I'm really looking forward to the way that VR can mess with our conception of space um, and what we can parse as real, but until we really understand what real space feels like, uh, subverting those paradigms is less possible and potentially a lot more disorienting. So by means of wrap up, um, I'm really inspired by this, this blog post by Robert Yang called A Progressive Future for VR. Uh, in it, he exhorts artists to s and weirdos to stay in VR while it's still open to change, to be, continue to be agents of change within VR, because these things are not yet set in stone. There's so many aspects of VR that are really still open to change. 
how we involve folks in narrative, how we interact with other people in our lives, uh, how we interact with or don't interact with com competing media and information that's competing for our attention, what spaces mean, how our brains conceive of those space and experience those spaces, uh, and what it means to have multiple versions of reality sort of existing side by side or on top of each other. I trust that all of you as creators are answering these questions, and I really look forward to being inspired by all of you. That's it. Thanks.